Like the total deal would be 1.5, but they only want to give you this to start. And it's like, nah, nigga, I got offered a 360, but they didn't want to give me no percent back in exchange. So it's like, they can't properly assess value and tell you why it's just standard. And I, I think standard is for niggas who do standard shit. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday. Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, every stream your podcast here at the intersection of creative and currency. Uh -huh. Artists, don't let people think being artistic means you can't be about your business and entrepreneurs, you can be creative too. This is No Labels and we got the very perfect guest for the idea <laughs> of No Labels. But again, the name is No Labels Necessary, which means, right, you're going to get it regardless. It doesn't mean you don't do labels. It means you can get it without the labels and they can come along for the ride if they want to. None other than La Russell. We are in the backyard, come the on. pergola. Come on. Check the environment. Yeah. What's up, bro? Man, I'm well. I'm well. Man. Honored. This is dope, bro. This is, yeah, this, is hard, bro. this is a beautiful scenery, bro. Come on. Like catching the vibe. And I definitely want to get into it, like in terms of just the operation, right? right. But of course, we got to start with the story, right? Come on. Get a sense of how you started. Uh, I was just talking to your dad while you were rehearsing. He was telling me when y'all have the shows, cause we haven't witnessed the show yet, right? That y'all got like a, a, a bounce house outside that y'all put out there. He told you he seen you on YouTube? No, nah, he ain't told me that. Oh, okay, he just nah. started. So, like, we just started talking, you know? He was just being like, hey man, who in my backyard? What's up, right. you know? <laughs> I'm Big Rush, you know what I'm saying? He hit me with that and we just started talking. But, um, you know, again, the environment, like, to go this direction, it's a direction that a lot of people don't go. That energy, uh, like it's not necessarily cool in hip hop, especially. So, like starting early on, I heard that you were a, under a different name. Yeah. Right? Yep. Was it? Toto Shakur, Shakur, right? Toto. Toto. Yeah. Toto Shakur. I just used that as a moniker, but my artist name was Toto. Okay. So, what created that? That vibe. What inspired that? And then I want to understand what made the transition happen. Uh, Tupac Shakur is my favorite artist. And Toda just came from just being around, young, just, you know, nickname. And then um, uh, the change was I finally made an album that was just like um, hella close to home. It was my life story. It was all of everything that I experienced and been through. And my music has been mostly that my whole career. But this one was more personal. Like yeah. my first two albums was more outer political just talking about what's happening the times and then when i dropped that album it was like i need to tell my story as la russell as who i am as who my parents named me you feel me so it was just it just felt like a legacy move that's crazy because it, it sounds like it's like i know exactly who i am now you know what i mean and i not not that you never knew who you were but like as an artist and how I represent myself. It sounds like it was like a clarity that came. Definitely, like that That was the moment that was like, okay, this is a story that has to be told by me because it's mine, right? And I was aware of that. Uh, not so much of like, I know who I am, but uh, you know, that still that sense of like, I know I'm not that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So early on when you were you know, you're inspired, right? Tupac, were there any other main inspirations that you had? Uh, everybody, really. Of course, the Kendrick, Drake's, Coles, Hove, uh, Nas, but really everything. Like, I used to just consume a lot of music. I hear some shit that was completely left field, and it's just everything. Everything that, that sounded great, you know? And still to this day, I kind of consume music just as a whole, not really genre-bound. Got you. Got you. So are you... Like uh, as an artist, all right, how do you look at this turn of, of like the rebrand? Because you still got that other page up. When, when yeah. I when I saw it, it was a page. I think it got like twenty thousand monthly yeah. listeners. Like so, what? Are, now knowing that you're on this side of it, like why is that? One, why is that page up? And then how do you? Because um, to me, it's not a rebrand. It's evolution, mm. right? And when you evolve, you don't always get rid of what was there evolution sometimes just improves what was there right like you start off with an iron that's just steel then you add a cable to it and you add a steam button but you don't get rid of the iron you know you just keep improving it so um to me it wasn't a rebrand i wasn't becoming something new i was just evolving as a person 
as an artist too. Yeah, it's almost like leaving breadcrumbs of the story out for fans yeah, to find. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Not you know, it's not it's not like any phase I was ashamed of or anything that I needed to get rid of. It was just something that I needed to grow out of. You feel me? And what time period was that album? What year was that when you made that switch? 2019. Or, uh, no, 20, 2020. 2020. 2020. Yep. Hey, it's a hell of a time to make that switch. Yeah, it was COVID. <laughs> it was COVID. It was a whole lot of shit going yeah. on. And, yep, it was a perfect time. But so, like, moving up out of that and getting back to even the community aspect of everything, like, you got a whole team here, man, right? Yeah. A whole operation. How do you look at building team? Because that is like the number one question most artists ask outside of. So it's like, how do I get money? How do I get signed? Mm -hmm. Right. And then how do I build a team? Those are like the three questions we get personally the most often. How did you look at building team? Um, I never I never had to look at it or think of it a certain way because I just utilized the people that was around me. Like you said, when you look around like. I've known Chow Main since high school. We have like new additions, but a lot of my original team was just my friends that was around me. And as we evolved, I met new people. That was like, that's a key component. But I never had to uh, focus on building a team. I just, I just became a great player. There's not too many niggas who don't want to play with Steph Curry. You feel me? Like you do all the work you're supposed to do. And naturally people are like, Send me there, trade me there, draft me, you know, yeah. you know, they want to play on that team. So I never had to focus on building it much. I was just building my shit. And as I built my shit, people walk by and they like, I like this. I want to help, you know. Mm. That's a beautiful way to say that, bro. Yeah, that's yeah. that's, that's right, a right. perfect way to say that. <laughs> so your your friends who have been around, were any of them in music? Y'all doing music together at some point or? Not, not really. I kind of pulled a bunch of people who were just my homies. <laughs> no one was... um. Uh, Tessie was in the music. Uh, we kind of started releasing music together, but for the most part, everybody I pulled in was just a homie. And it was like, bro, I need some help. Could you hold this camera? Could you hear recording? Could you do this? You know, if, if someone's around, I'm going to ask for help if I need it. And then it just naturally, we start going, working more and more people come in. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't, no one was really into this field, but everyone supported me and what I was doing. Have you ever had any moments where it was like, all right, you need to switch roles. You like you small forward right now. You need to be center or. Of course, I mean those are uh, that's every day. That that was that was me before there was anybody on the team. You yeah. feel me? So naturally, everyone replicates. No one, no one here really has a role. Everyone is willing to do whatever they need to do for us to win and get a ring. You feel me? There's not really any assigned roles for anybody. There's no job that's below anybody or above anybody. Sarai's carrying a fucking base module into the house right now. Yeah. You feel me? Like, yeah. Sarai also works on merch and she also operates on a live stream and whatever, edit video, whatever the fuck needs to get done. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. Is that Was that like a, a culture you had to like make happen or did it just come organic? Uh, it came organically. Uh, I'm a firm believer, like, if you leave by demonstration, people gonna follow. If I'm carrying a shit ton of equipment and there's four niggas around me, just naturally, the right people going to be like, let me grab one too. And the people who don't, they wean themselves out. You yeah. know, they wasn't willing to help or assist. So, uh, yeah, it was definitely organic. I was always willing to do the work myself. So it was just, it was going to get done regardless or not. So it was just easy for people to kind of integrate into the system because it was already created. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, speaking of systems, man, like you are rehearsing on a Friday, you know, you know, and I know a lot of artists who don't rehearse at all. Right. right. I think we just talked about somebody who hadn't had a performance and they were already popping. And that's a new that's a pretty prevalent thing today. It's a newer thing in terms of this era is the first era to really have that as a problem. Right. But it's a pretty consistent and common thing. Uh, what makes you in this era seeing that and having that as an option? be someone who works as hard as you do at the performing that aspect of it? Um, <laughs> it just feel dumb to go on stage and rap over a zone playing. I mean, to me, it just, it just does. It's like, what the fuck I'm going to do that for? Yeah. If that's the case, I, I, I would have nothing to do. <laughs> there's really, there's nothing for me to do up here. Yeah. You feel me? You took my job away <laughs> at that point. So really for me, it's like, I just, I love the shit I do. I love being able to rap. I love rapping. 
I love getting with the homies and they start playing instruments and I just come up with verses over. I just enjoy it. You feel me? Yeah. It's uh yeah, I just enjoy it. it's me shooting my shots. It's like a workout like you do in any other form. If you a boxer, you go box. I just come in the backyard and rap and work on my shit. You feel me? So today's Sunday. No, today's Friday. The show is on Sunday. Yeah. Is this the only day that you practice this, this week? Like, what is that schedule? Nah, we've been rehearsing all week. Um, we took like a little break, but generally, like, I kind of blew up off rehearsals. Like, niggas used to see me rehearsing in my garage on, and it was going viral yeah. on the internet. I've been rehearsing a long time. Like, there's not really any set schedule when I feel like rehearsing. I come out here and get my work in. Some days I take too much time off and I get rusty and I'm like, I got to get back in there. But yeah, it's just kind of like ritual. Like, we probably, we just go put our shots up. That's dope because I never thought about it this way and I wasn't aware. You said you blew up off of rehearsals. So I blew up off a lot of shit. I mean, of course, <laughs> but yeah, but, but that was definitely that went crazy for you. Just the fact that you caught that on camera and then you were putting it out there. Yeah. Well, we was live streaming them. I mean, we was always filming them and we'd have pieces that go. Then we start doing the live streams and certain shit was like, ah, oh, we got to share this. But yeah, we, we was docking everything. We was filming everything, putting it up on YouTube. We just looked today. I was talking to Slash because uh, I'm like, how you see how many videos we got? We got fucking 1,200 videos on YouTube. And I think I started that channel probably in like 2000. 18, 2017, started uploading content. So 1,200 videos in a span of three, four years, you know? Yeah. What got you into that? Like to actually start putting the videos up seriously, the live stream, like how did you evolve to that? Um, Just sharing content. Like we, I've always shot content because it's like, brother, how else you gonna market your shit? You can't just post a song. So I've always kind of just shared it. And when I initially started rehearsing, we didn't use to record them. I just used to be rehearsing, but I was like, this is something people should be able to witness and experience too. If I can yeah. get, if I can throw the shit on YouTube and then get a couple thousand, hundred thousand views, it's like, bro, that's free. You feel me? So might as well. Go ahead, you got it, bro. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, like, what is, what is your content infrastructure and process look like right now? Is it just, are you guys just looking at all the contents you you gather for the weekend? You're looking at how you can repurpose things in a certain way. Like, do you have a certain structure? Uh, kinda. So we we do um. We usually have a schedule, right? So initially when we started, I did a 30-day run. I was posting like once a day. Then we start building it up. So we would do an interview clip, a quote uh, a quote post, a live performance. Then uh, we do something that's like today, like, you know, real-time shit, some type of announcement. And then sometimes we'll end with another live performance because I was always like, I always want people to see what I do. But now, um, similar formula, but we just lessened it because it's like, I only want to share the shit that I'm like, I love this so much. People need to see it. You feel me? You need to be a part of it. I really need to get this message out. But same formula. We film everything and the things that make us smile or make us feel something or make us laugh or spark us is the shit that we choose to share. Yeah. So, so are you hands on with picking the content or is it the team Definitely. picking those moments so, for you? Uh, me, Tieta, Splash, like Splash now, he does the vlogs. He'll send the vlogs in. I watch each vlog and then I, I, I'm going to cut this. I'll do a final cut, drop it up. Um, Certain clips will come to me, like after each rehearsal, I usually go in and I'll drop it in and bounce it or Tieta drop it in and bounce it. I'll skim through, find the one that I love. But yeah, I'm still super active, super hands on. Sounds like you actually enjoy being a part of it, mm. being a part of it. Yeah, and that's because a lot of artists, they just make music or just want to make music, you feel me? They don't have a love beyond that. But with me, it's like I started off doing this shit. You know, before rap was going, I was shooting a bunch of content and sessions, and it's just like that's my rhythm. That's what I'm used to doing. And I just want shit to go that I really have my heart in and, and support and, and believe in. And, and, you know, I want, I, I should be, you should be hands on with that. That's your art. That's your shit. What doesn't go out? Because you put a lot of shit out. What doesn't go out? Um, every song is not a home run. Like some performance when I'm rapping, I'm just like, just getting it on. I'm just getting my shots up. You know, everything is in a half court shot. And those ones is like, nah, we don't have to share. You can put it on YouTube, but we don't have to share it on the timeline. So, you know, out of, a, out of an hour interview, sometimes we'll walk away with 30 clips that was like, okay, 
these these were moments. And out of that 30, we might say, but these 10 are the ones that niggas is looking for, yeah. right? And that's what goes up in the remainder. It's like, if it goes on YouTube or it goes somewhere, cool. But if not, I'm not pressed because it wasn't like, um, it wasn't life changing to me. It was like, oh, if it's shared, great. If it's yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not mad at, well, you at it. You got some good shots and then you got some highlights. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly. The one that's going on the Tinder is different from the one that's going on. Nah, I'm just fucking around. <laughs> that's real though, man. That's real though. You feel me? But um, man, and and it just helps with like content control. Like I feel like I got to a point where I was posting so much, it was kind of like it's funny. Mick Jenkins, uh, he's one of my favorite artists, and he hit me. And he was like, "Bro, I love your wave. I had to unfollow because it's like an overload. It's so much." But even though I'm unfollowing, I still follow you. I see everything because you put out so much content. But it even had me thinking, like, "Man, that's right." Like, because we had such an abundance, and then I was like, "I right, let's narrow down even more to the ones that's like we love this. Niggas need to know this because you got shit that people it's cool if they know, and then you got shit that's like no." They need to know this, right? And those are the things that I really want to make sure I'm putting out and sharing. Do you feel like you had to go through that process, though, to really have your system popping the way it is now? Uh, definitely. Every every part of it was like everything you learn from each one. Yeah. You feel me? Everything it goes through, you learn from it. Like you, you're supposed to come out with bruises and marks and shit. That, that means you, you figured some shit out. <laughs> you feel me? You had to go maneuver. Yeah, I love that because to me, like going high quantity, you're really building a muscle at that point, right? And once you got the muscle, you can be selective. But a lot of people being selective, they don't have the muscle. Exactly. You know? And that's the thing, like, my thing is I always have it. So whether I share it or not, it doesn't matter because I have enough. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have more than I need than not have what I need at all. You feel me? So I'm always okay with us ending with a hundred and it's like, all right, now we can narrow it down. But if you don't even have enough, you know, you can't get no post though. You can't share nothing. So, um, yeah, I feel like I think quantity and quantity could be accomplished. And I'm a prime example of that. I think probably in the past year, if it's 365 days, I post three, four times a day. I posted over 1200 times in a year. Right. And I've, I grew like, 750,000 in the past fucking two years, you know, off quantity and quality. Like we gave people both. And then once you get to that point, you can start narrowing down and getting to just quality, you know, and lower mm -hmm. quantity. Yeah. But I think initially you got to let people know you out there. They don't know you out there. It's like, bro, you could, you could have one quality piece, but it's like, nah, bro, I want my shit on every corner. Yeah. You can't drive around here and not know McDonald's exist. Once someone knows you exist, then they can determine if they love it or not. But if they don't know you exist, they ain't going to never get to try it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So you just got to get up out of obscurity first. Like, just yeah. just see me. Just see me. And then uh, you can figure out if you like me later. I mean, it, exactly. And it's like, um, man, like I say, just wanting to share. Like, don't even do it to be seen. Do it because I did some shit that I think is dope. You feel me? And I want to share that. Yeah. And then you could take it from there because when you get into that habit of like, I just want to be seen, then you start sharing whatever, you know, just because you like, you got to keep up with the numbers and you got to keep that shit going. And that, that don't never lead to nothing great. <laughs> that never lead to nothing great. Yeah. You know, you get, you get hold out and you get tired fast, especially in this industry. Like when you start moving, you get hold out fast. <laughs> You'll be on flight after flight, niggas flying you out, you hold out. <laughs> All right, next thing you know, you got a BBL. I can't disagree with you there. Now, <laughs> with that being said, you talk about industry. Like, how do you view the industry personally? Um, as the industry, um, the industry is everything you've heard about since you was a kid <laughs> and more. Yeah. Everything that you think exists about the industry exists. It's true. You feel me? It's not vague. It's really true on the good and the bad side. Like all the good shit, the crazy shit they do, there's like, oh, they took this platinum by doing this, this, that. That's true. All the other shit too about niggas going crazy and having to deal with. Man, I just found out that nigga Prince signed away his birth name. You know how crazy that is for a nigga to say, I want to do business with you. I need your birth name. What, yeah. what kind of nigga take your birth name? Yeah. A nasty nigga. Like, that's insane. I want to do business with you. 
but I need your birth name. You know, like that shit exists as well, both sides of it. So to me, the industry is, is exactly what I thought it was going to be coming into it. And we know you haven't signed certain deals, right? You, you've been a part of deals. There's the viral clip of you talking about Rock Nation hitting you and not, not getting you the money. I'm sure people probably hit you up about that. <laughs> right. That was that was a big one. It's funny because that clip went viral before we posted it on our page. So oh, I was man. seeing everything. And I'm like, where's this fucking coming from? And it was just another page that clipped it up and took that clip. Right. But it's like, you know, it's funny. As I grow, I'm more like understanding of niggas human. Right. And it's like. Niggas going to move how they going to move and how they know how to move best. You feel me? It ain't even. It's not intentional. You feel me? They would have offered the same shit to every other nigga. And that is what it is. That's how they do business. Right. That's separate from me. And, and I get it. And I respect that. A nigga didn't have to offer me nothing at all. And it's like, cool. He came and offered something. But it's like, it's still, it is what it is. Like I say, you did what you did. Yeah. You, you feel me? You just choose not to be a part of it. I just choose not to be a part of it. But it's like, if that's how you move and maneuver, that's your thing. It's whatever. To me, to actually be able to turn down deals, right, I'm sure you've had some deals that were relatively good sums of money, right? But to turn it down, that means you have to have a vision, all right? You have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in whatever you're building. What are you building? Disneyland. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the best way to put it. You feel me? Disneyland. When you go into Disneyland, everything you see, feel, touch, buy, express, like, that's how this shit feels for people when they come in here and it's only getting bigger. That's what we scaling. We building Disneyland. People becoming familiar with the characters. They know who Tietta is. They know Splash is. They know Millie, you know. They know Chow. They, that's, that's all the characters when you go to Disney and people want to take their pictures. Like, we're building that type of infrastructure. Mm. Have you studied Disney in that way? Yeah. Yeah, him, Sam Walton, you know, there's a book called Imagineering based on like Disney and everything he built. And uh, yeah, I, I study a lot of them. Just Steve Jobs, man. I used to wake up every morning and go drive to, to my little walking spot. And I just listened to his speeches and Tim Cook and just everybody who like invented gigantic things that we can't really fathom. Yeah, yeah. Speak more on that, man. Like, was it always through music that you knew you would want to take that type of information and build on? Or did you have any other type of, you know, interest that you figured, like, maybe I might be building this. I might create an app or I might, I don't know. Um, music kind of opened the door for all of that. And uh, I, always, I thought it would be my launch pad in, but I didn't know for certain. But I knew that I would get. I knew that I'd become something every every since I started working, like every job I worked at, I started at a very low level and was able to move up extremely fast and increase pay rate. I was always creating something new at every job I went to or building or improving the system that existed already. So yeah. I knew that I was going to be able to do that at a grander scale. And then music is like, as it start moving and I start seeing the public response, I just was able to apply that same worth ethic and the same shit to it. Like I'm literally a nigga who's here because I've done it. 10,000 times like Steph Curry shoots the way he shoots because he shot more than everyone else and I've, I'm the exact example of that I've done this shit more than everyone else I love that man because you know talking to your pops earlier he told a story of just him listening to you early on all right and he wasn't even fully aware of what your talent was right. he started paying attention and I mean I, he might have said like seven years old or something like that it was, it was a pretty young age if you could think back to your mind back then, like those times you were building music early on, what was it like? You know what I mean? What, what, what were your dreams in your head? Um, I don't remember having many back then. I was just chilling. <laughs> I was just lying. I wasn't thinking about that shit. Yeah, I was just chilling. I was just lifing at that point. I used to love to rap still then. I used to write like poetry and shit. I had a boom box and uh, I used to download like uh, instrumentals from LineWire and burn them to a CD and play them on there and just rap over them. I used to go to school and my boy Larry used to beat on tables and I used to rap. So like it was just something I just always enjoyed doing, but I never... I never was like, I'm gonna be famous. You feel me? Like, at least not, <laughs> not to me. If I said it, it was just like fucking around as a kid, you know? But uh, yeah, it was just something I enjoyed doing. I don't even, um, I don't think I had a specific thing that I wanted to be 
back then. Man, that's interesting because it's with the talent being so clear early on. But oftentimes, I guess you do find that people who have so much talent. But that's even the thing, like the talent still be murky early on. Like I wasn't tight. I was better than other niggas my age, but they wasn't tight. <laughs> you feel me? So it's like it's not a clear thing. It's just yeah, like yeah. <laughs> you're the best person on the court until a nigga who really play comes on the court, you know, like yeah. and that had to grow and develop. <laughs> what point were you like, oh, yeah, I got it? Um, Probably like 10th or 11th grade. I had like a battle at school and it was like. I got it. After that, it was it was it was up. It was gone, and I knew I got it. But I even um even then I didn't have the confidence of I got it. Like I'm finna make it and blow up and be famous. It was I got it. Like nigga, I can rap. Yeah. You feel me? Uh, cause even after after I graduated, I took a break and was just kind of working and building. You feel me? Cause I didn't have that confidence like I could make it, but I knew I could rap. Mm. So, with all that in mind, there's La Russell, and then there's Good Company, right? A lot of artists have merch and things like that, um, but you have an entirely different brand house, a media company. Why is that? What is Good Company, like in your words, and then why that route so early on? Good Company is just a creative collective. Like, that's how I've always looked at it from when I started. And it was just a way for me to um, be a part of things and help everybody I wanted to help without having to have my name just like, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, this is just like, no, it's a unit. And I had a bunch of people that was just fucking with me that would help me do things. So it's like, instead of us having to put 10 names, it's like, this is what it is. You feel me? This is what we're building. And that just grew. It grew into like a culture and a community and a society. But um, yeah, it's just a creative collective. It's just niggas working. <laughs> hey, bro, y'all work hard and y'all work efficient, man. You know? Like I Just the things that I've seen, like, you're you're not putting all the information out there right now, bro. Like I know how much it takes to do this stuff <laughs> as well as you do it. You know what I mean? Like you you saying it like, yeah, we just do this and we making it happen, but like you this know, this is not a connection thing. This is a but it, but it it's not far from that. Yeah. It's uh because it's really that is repetition. Like yeah. if you seen some of our first live sessions and our first shit and our first cameras and first mics, yeah. like bro, my first mic they was like plastic, like toy mics, and we we like we really had to figure that shit out, rehearsing out the speaker through the aux cable and a yeah. nigga playing the instrumentals on his phone. So like it, what this is is really a result of a nigga just doing it every single day. It's not much more complex in that you know beyond the work of course there's a mind behind it but that can't be replicated so it's nothing that you could really give a nigga a tip on because no one can think like you but in terms of the blueprint is it's the work a lot of people who don't make it today is just because they don't want to do the work yeah yeah so you you're saying like really i'm not following a specific blueprint we know what we want to achieve every single day we practice and then we try to figure out how to make it better and that's this is the result of a, a thousand tweaks and a thousand. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a I mean, at this point, there's not many blueprints for me to follow with what I've done. I've created a lot of new shit. You yeah. feel me? So we're kind of just steamrolling. I get to take things from people who did things prior, but there's not too many people who's done what I've done. It's just selling stocks and proud to pay show offer based merch and offer based ticketing. There is no blueprint for me to look to, you know, like. The last blueprint that laid a lot of ground for me was Nipsey's. And, and after he passed, I was able to take that and help innovate and create something new. So now it's like we we just steamrolling. Everything I do that's new is the new blueprint. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned the the, the offer based stuff. Like what 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 kind of got you to the point where you even wanted to try that? You know what I'm saying? Cause I was doing proud to pay at first and um I was getting whooped at times because like I had too much heart. Right. And I was like, I'm gonna let anyone do whatever. Right. And some people take a lot of advantage of that. Uh, most people fuck with you. But there's some people that like, I remember when we first started Proud to Pay merch, a nigga ordered like 10 things for a dollar each. And I had to call him and I was like, yo, bro, come on, dog. And I ended up going to his house cause to, to, to drop off shit. And, I, and we just had a conversation. And really, like, it was just like, bro, I was just blown away at the fact that you could do this. And I was like, yeah, but think about everybody. You feel me? Like, if you take them all. 
then what everybody else gonna get who wants to support and pay? Like, you feel me? But um, after we got from that, I was like, we need to create a system that allows me to determine my worth as well, because it's kind of fucked up for me to be an artist and not be able to determine what I think is acceptable for my art or my time or my energy too. So we made the offer-based system, which innovated everything, because now I could say yes or no to something, right? Can you clarify the difference between those two? So proud to pay, when we used to do proud to pay shows, you can come to the door and you can pay whatever you want and you can get in. Merch, you can go online, you can put in whatever you want and you can get in. Offer base is now you go into the site and you put in whatever you're willing to pay. And I have a back end that can say, yeah, that's acceptable to me or no. I like that, man. Right, and that allows me to accommodate both. You feel me? Some people still get shit for a dollar because it's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fuck around. Like, I, I get it. You feel me? But it also allows me to to fuck with the people who are like, no, I really support you and I want to rock with you and I want to make sure you're taken care of too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Cause it's, it's, I always feel like artists, you guys are always fighting that battle between, like you said, me trying to or you trying to display what you feel like your worth is, and then also trying to gauge like what you think the fans. Thank you, work. And niggas don't understand. The artist pays everybody yeah. for everything, yeah. right? Like everybody else does a service to the artist. The artist pays and compensates everything. Everybody else is on a service base. So by the time you spent twenty, twenty-five thousand to make sure everybody else straight, ain't nobody paying you. You gotta wait quarters for streaming, and we all know how that look. You feel me? So it's like. The artist takes on all the burden most of the time. Like, I've spent more money than any collaborator I know. And everyone eats off the art I create. <laughs> you feel me? I pay everybody. Everyone don't pay me. You feel me? So that's what people don't understand. It'd be a lot of discussions and people upset. But it's like, bro, the artist puts out everything. And then ultimately, the artist is the one that makes everything blow up. You feel me? When, when shit goes crazy and viral and the song keeps getting repeated, it's what the artist put on it. You feel me? It, that's what makes that shit go. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot that you got to put in as an artist just to get any point. Which is why I get why niggas sign to labels. You feel me? Because it's a lot you have to do to get people to come to your backyard. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that system is is beautiful, man. That offer base versus just hearing the proud to pay. But I think you. I pushed that out there. You tested it. You you ran with it very well. It was great to even hear about that and, and build around that. Um, and we still do it. Like yeah. albums, yeah, right? Right now, great. you can go online right now and get an album. Probably you can get jibs, right? You know, whatever you want to pay. So we still we still do that with certain things. But uh, with shows, it's just like. Like I say it's a different Too thing because they're so, to, man, we yeah. bring a lot of people. We bring instruments out. We have to secure venues. Secure, just There's a ton of things that go into it where it's like, bro, I can't ha I can't let you do me like that this time. But you feel me? Right. You know, you know, but we keep that door open. So it's always a possibility. I'm probably the only artist of my caliber that you might be able to see if you a dollar short, five dollars short, twenty dollars short, thirty dollars short, fifty, a hundred dollars short. Shit, you might still get in the show. You know, we had a L.A. show and someone I be passing the mic around so people can ask questions and shit. And someone was like, man, I only had a dollar. I rode here on a scooter and you let me in this show, you know, and it was like, that's what this shit is for. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine that. That's the stories that people are going to remember. Personally. You have forever fans. Yeah. That's the thing, like with a forever fan, you might have got a dollar that first show, but throughout the rest of that year, you probably end up making three, four hundred off of that one person because they're gonna come buy hoodies, merch, come to show everything. Yeah, when they do get some money. Exactly. And that's really the goal of they this for an sure artist. Let me take a quick second to tell you about Forever Fan because many of you know that my agency is responsible for helping multiple artists blow up tens of billions of views and billions of streams. But I wanna specifically talk about a strategy that we've used to help artists get millions of streams on their very first song. And as a matter of fact, in the last 12 months, an artist got signed to a major label using this specific strategy and you'll never guess what it is. Pre-saves. Yeah, that's right. Pre-saves. They're extremely powerful when you do them correctly, but most people don't understand how to do it. See, the problem becomes when you put all this effort for this pre-save campaign and then the song finally comes out. And then what happens after that? Nothing. You're starting from ground zero again because you're not about to ask people to pre-save every single time you drop a song. 
So I'm here to put you on to our solution for that, which is Forever Fan, a platform that removes this massive pain for artists by making it so when a fan pre-saves one of your songs, they automatically pre-save every single song that you drop after that. So your work doesn't just create a one-time fan of a single song, it creates a Forever Fan. And you can take advantage of this same solution. Go to foreverfanmusic.com so that you can get more streams and a deeper relationship with your fans for the same amount of effort. Foreverfanmusic.com. Check it out now. Forever fans, man. I love, I love that term because that's what people should focus on. There's a lot of artists that are streaming way better than you, right? Yeah but they're probably not making a tenth of what you're making, right? <laughs> and, and that's being built different, right. like the way you you build things up. And a huge part of that is just fan first. So for even to me, the way I, I see this personally is you're building this and people don't see it. Like people can now say, oh, he's not hitting these numbers, typical industry numbers, whatever, whatever. But it's like it's like this undercurrent going right now. Man, and that's that's what's beautiful because uh and we seen it. You know, all the label meetings we had earlier, they're like, um, you know, they would only offer us a certain amount because they're like based on streams, streams, streams. And it's like, we don't stream a lot. But you know what comes from me being on your label. And why are you acting like you don't? Yeah. You feel me? There there was a time that Drake didn't stream a lot. There was a time Kendrick didn't stream a lot. There was a time every artist who somebody now didn't stream a lot. Right. And we can't base it off of that. And what's even different with me is like I don't stream a lot, but I sell real records. I probably sold more albums than most of the people who do stream well. So that's not even a good metric to gauge me off of. I think that's a bad metric in, in general or the industry has concurred, encouraged a lot of people to buy into that system. Right. So it works for a lot of people and right. for them, I get it. it, makes it easier to make better decisions, lower your risk as a label, as a business. It all makes sense, yes, right? But you also have to have that flexibility for the special cases, right? There's, to me, when I see a you, there's just so many other things. If I see this guy's bringing in this type of money, this type of community and doing these type of things, there is a thing for those, and you know what it's called? A 360. <laughs> you know, it's, but, and this is the, you know, this is something I learned. I used to think a 360 deal was like a bad thing because everyone previously got fucked by it. But yeah. it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Like Jay Z's venture with Live Nation, the Rock Nation, was a 360, right? Yeah. It's a good thing if you're bringing in a bunch of different kinds of revenues. The only thing is like, it must make sense. I got offered a 360, but they didn't want to give me no percent back in exchange. So it's like, why would you have a percent of everything I make, but I don't get nothing back in exchange? And you're going to make all this money. Oh, shouldn't I get something too? What about every nigga who comes to your label after me because I was here? What about all the rapport and offers you get now because you have LaRussell here, you know? Like, oh, they don't make it, they right don't now, make bro. it, they don't make it uh, reciprocated. You feel me? Nah, I, go deeper into that shit right there. Because that's, <laughs> That's a level of value and understanding of value that people don't. And it can't be quantified in, a, in an advance or a specific number, yeah. right? You have to really tailor things like that. Yeah. But when you start talking like that, it's like it becomes a different conversation. And it's like no one wants to deal with that because they're trying to look for the easy thing that they can sign and make hot. But it's like. Bro, we I, that just it don't make sense for me to approach those deals. You know, it's like how do you want ten percent of somebody else's thing, all of it, on every lane, but you don't want to give none of yours? And the only thing you're gonna do is I'm gonna put money up and provide my staff. And it's like, well, I could put money up and provide my own staff. You feel me? That shit should be fair, no matter what. It should be fair, back and forth. Have you the first time you got offered a deal that you consider to be like a good amount of money. Can you say whatever, like, you don't only have to be the company, but like, well, well, how much amount of money was it where you like, yo, this is a good amount of money and I'm gonna turn it down. Like, and then um, what was the mindset like that? Was it hard or did you have to think through it a little bit? Rock Nation second, their return offer was a good amount of money that I had to turn down. I think like 750,000 total across a span of projects. Uh, Def Jams was like 350,000. Um, and then, yeah, every, the deal I got after that, that was a good amount of money I ended up doing, uh, a partnership with. So yeah, but those were the, I think 750 was like the highest that was like, yeah, we're going to walk away from that. <laughs>
Was it easy that first time? Like, I'm sure now they made it easy because of what happened the before that. Happened. Exactly. They made it really easy to say no because of all the shit that kind of happened. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've seen that similar situation, not even just as an artist. I've seen it as uh, like people I know who like work jobs. Right. So say I work in a job and it's one thing. You know what? Leave. There actually was another for one point okay. five that 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 oh, was turned okay. down. There was okay. another. Okay. <laughs> you you know, that one? right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> See, but what what yeah. they do like that one was. Yeah. Difficult, but easy to turn down because they ration the money so much. Like the total deal would be 1.5, but they only want to give you this to start. And it's like, nah, nigga. <laughs> There's a lot of deals where artists finish out the deal and don't see half of the money that was ever mentioned. And I'm not even talking about, oh, because they charge it to your studio time. It's just like, this is going to be a hundred thousand dollars worth of marketing that you get. And then they only spend like 15K of the budget because they have to approve everything. Artists don't know that that can happen. Like, and a lot of these labels back end system is built in a way that's not conducive to the artist to where you can see what it actually got allocated towards and how much. So it's real murky. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that is why like you had made me think about the deal and the way you said that happened with I think it was Rock Nation where it's one thing if I'm working a job, I make 50K or something. Right. And then I say, hey, I'm going over here. And then you and then you say, oh no, stay over here. I'm gonna try to like offer you 55k. It's one thing, okay, that's a little bit more money. But if if the other person offers me 150, and then all of a sudden you like, oh, I could pay you 175. It's like, whoa, see, you know, like funny. you could have paid me this all the time. Early on, like talking to like Wendy Strait, all of them, they yeah. used to always be like, you know, you gotta tell them what you want, you know, specifically. And I used to always be like. No, I want to see what they offer me, right? Because if I tell you what I want, it's very easy for you to try to go and appease me. But I want to see what's my value to you. What do you see it's worth? I've gotten a lot of offers where I call after and I'm like, what does this mean? Why did you choose this amount? What is behind it, right? And a lot of that shit don't have good reasoning. They can't properly assess value and tell you why it's just standard. Like, this is what we do. This is standard, you know? And that, that's what that, that shit be. You feel me? I hate that term. Like, like I get it, but I don't. I just had, like, I get to say, <laughs> hey, this is what team, <laughs> I, I don't get the terms, right? But like, I like, I just had a lawyer conversation a couple of days ago dealing with a, a, a deal or whatever. And the whole argument on the other side was standard, right? And I had explained, I was like, yeah, I get that standards happen, but like if the standard's not right, it doesn't matter. Right. And I, I think standard is for niggas who do standard shit, right? <laughs> I think that every That's deal has to be looked at differently. Yeah. If it's someone who's doing standard shit, standard means anyone can do it. This is a, a universal thing. It's easy. So if you find an artist that's like, oh, well, yeah, 10 other artists make music like this. That's a standard situation. Yeah. But if you find someone who's doing things that no one else is doing, I think that standard should be the last kind of deal that you offer them, right? Yeah. <laughs> they should have a deal like no one else because no one else is doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's weird about I me. Mean, I, I know people got to get, get shit approved by their accounting department. Man, they got there. You know, a lot of times these people who you're talking to aren't even necessarily the decision. Yeah, they don't have the power. They're they're right. working with what they can they can work with. And I get that, but it just it's oftentimes it's a bad look, right? But it's not that obviously the system works for a lot of people. Somebody like you seems like you're probably gonna end up holding out. I'm not only call, call it holding out. You're gonna continue to build, and then you know, like Nipsey, one day down the road there might be something that makes sense. But you're not yeah. you don't, you're not really looking for a deal at this point. You know, and that's that's kind of I mean, we we do deals just in a different fashion, like. Okay. Every deal I've been able to do, I've been able to structure on my own term to deliver things that I'm comfortable delivering for amounts of money that I'm cool with, with uh, paying back and dealing with. And I own all my shit and I could take my shit wherever I want to take it. You know, like that that's the whole thing to me. Like, you know, a lot of labels give you the, the creative control shit, but it's like 
it's not creative freedom, right? Creative control means you have the control to make whatever you want, but you don't have the control in terms of where we gonna deliver it, when we gonna deliver it, how it's gonna come out. That ain't no fucking creative control, nigga, you feel me? So it's like hiding hiding under that terminology and those type of acts, I just, those deals don't make sense for me because I've always been an artist who've been able to do whatever the fuck I wanna do. And that's how I've got in here. Why would you break a system that's working already? Was it just instinct to, look at deals differently or was it just stuff not making sense because a lot of people even if they're doing something different you just you, you might say i don't like the way things are going and you just don't do a deal but to, but to realize hey i can negotiate and figure different ways to put this together and make sense with a reasonable person uh where did that come from had you did you study deals? Did you get advice? Man, I used to read, before I ever got offered a deal, I used to read all the music books, you know, how to win in a new music business and the 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 fucking white and blue one, David Passman or Donald, oh, Donald. Yeah, Donald. Donald. I've, read, I've read so many different media and marketing, just a bunch of different books on deals and how shit should look. But uh, most importantly, like, I got experience early from doing so many different things and negotiating shows and negotiating one-off shit here that, um, man, it just, as that shit start coming to the table, you know, certain shit makes sense and certain shit don't, but it's like, I've already experienced that. I don't have to do that again. It doesn't make sense for me. You feel me? Did you ever have like any type of typical situation when you were younger and, you know, maybe you had an early manager, went through a phase and did some of that typical stuff or? Never. I never. I had a few people come in that wanted to like be in that role and position, but no one who ever had anything that was like, yeah, you deserve that. I've always been self-managed and I always had my niggas that I could delegate to if I needed to. But even to this day, I'm self-managed. So I've had people come in and help. And I'm big on like, whatever you bring to the table, I'll split with you. So, you know, I've had people like Hovane and Shipes and um, Ty bring different things to me. And it's like, all right, I fuck with that. I'm down to do that. And we figure out how we do that. But uh, I've always been self-managed. <laughs> It makes me think about this this one clip I saw going viral from you where you talked about your team members having certain percentage uh, shares of your, your music. Can you talk about that a little bit yeah, more and what kind man. of push you to so, that? Man, I we we shares is, is the most beautiful thing about all this. So like all the homies got, you know, they distro account set up and they get they dumps every month where they get their money and they pay outs from all the work that we created. So anyone, uh, when we do live sessions, if you help shoot, if you do audio, if you do lighting, you're going to get a percent. Every album I release, if you did the album cover, if you mix, if you mastered, if you feature, you're going to get a percent. You're a producer. Um, if you help, like Tieta gets percents on everything because she does a lot of the admin for it, making sure it goes up, it releases, getting the lyrics put in. She gets a percent of them to everything that comes. Um, my dad gets percents in a lot of shit just because we was using everything that he provided to rehearse early and, you know, going in on merch and shit. Just uh, my daughter has percentages. My daughter's mom has percentages. Everybody, if you touch something or work on something that we're doing, you probably have a stake in it. And is the is the thinking behind it? I want you guys to be just as invested in this as I am, or was it something else that pushed you to do that? Just as invested, kind of, but more so, just like I don't want anybody to ever have to rely on me. And and it's like music is is in a perpetuity. They're gonna be getting paid forever. You know, they get to look at that every month, and there's money in there that's from work that they did. Not work that I paid them for what they did for me, but work that they did themselves from their own contributions. And I just think that's necessary. Whether you invested or not, you helped out on something. You deserve to have a piece of what you helped create. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, man, because like, you're the first artist I've heard about doing something like that. Like, I, I, man, I feel like it's some new shit. I've been seeing it a lot after and it's beautiful because the blueprint is laid and being followed. But yeah, I, I, I haven't heard of too many doing it early. But Ty Bison, Ty Bazden, Brent Fire's manager, yeah. he was doing it. He's one of the first person I heard about splits from because he was doing it with their producers and shit through STEM. And I was like, Ha. And then one of my boys, Cujo, came was like, oh, you know, this your kid, you can split pay. So we started there. But I'm definitely an early pioneer. But Ty and Brent was doing it before me. <laughs> and the labels always kind of did it. They just call it master points. So if you ever heard like in past interviews, producers like, oh, they gave me a point on the master. That's the same thing. OK, so I just pretty much just 
but they never did it with creators at this level where the photographer, that's videographer, that's the, the, yeah, <laughs> right, that's exactly. The that's thing. the thing that changed, right? I'm doing it with more people, even, even the community. There's a lot of people who are fans of me who has percentages in my songs and shit. Like we have gold card members, so we create a membership. You get a gold card, you get added to a stock list, so you randomly get just percentages of different songs and you get to come to every show thrown by good company for free you just pull up yeah, show your car you win there right you mentioned this bro because there's so much shit that technology has provided but you don't need technology for everything right like the gold card that's basically like this nft concept right like all of these things you can do without having to wait for technology to evolve. If you want to do it, do it. Like it might be harder. Bro, when I went to Texas, sheets. a nigga came up to me and had his car in his hand and was like, they don't know. <laughs> and he felt good. He felt good. You feel me? It, what time is it? Okay. He felt phenomenal. You feel yeah. me? And it's a real physical car that we ship ourselves and we do it. Like you don't have to wait on technology. You yeah. got to Even before we, before we had the offer based ticketing platform set up and the shit online, me and Tieta had built a spreadsheet that we'd go through manually one by one, you know, all our first gold card, one by one spreadsheet. Go cards is still a manual spreadsheet. I won't create a system because I feel like it should be that where we go in and it's like, I I fuck with that, you know? Yeah, stock, yeah. buying stock is a spreadsheet. That's a manual process. I reach out myself. Hey, I fuck with this offer. I can do this or I can't. You feel me? All of everything is still, a lot of it is still a manual process because it has to be. Like we build in real community with people. Man, you mentioned community. I want to get to community. But while we're on these spreadsheets, you posted a spreadsheet from a show. Yeah. I think you and a promoter, after everything was bust down, made like $48, something in that vicinity, right? <laughs> right. I think you went up to San Francisco. That was me being lenient. It was less. <laughs> so we was in the red. We was in the red. Your point? That you made, too, was like, you know, it's not always a ball, you know, knock out the park, big win. Number one, a lot of people took the inspiration from this post in the way you posted it, where it's like, yo, you're not gonna win every day. There's wins and losses, but you gotta keep moving. That's what I, I saw a lot of people in the comments. Cause I look through the comments, try to get a vibe of how people are taking the information that gets put out, especially something like this that you don't see. That's that one of those there. necessary posts, right. right? Exactly. But my perspective, and this is when I really, really, really start fucking with you. Cause I like, I love music, but I'm one of those people who, like really respect how people move more than anything, right? And what I said, the fact that he even did this shit, the fact that the numbers are there, like people aren't tracking their stuff. And the fact that you have this tracked, next time you go out to the show, you can even look at things and like, all right, well, if the ticket's this much, da, 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 and, and make decisions off of that, right? Better decisions, right? right. So uh, how did even spreadsheets come, come to play? Like, was that like a, from the gate we did this in school or what? Bro. I used to work in aerospace, right? And I learned a lot of skills there to do like business contracts, everything. I learned a lot of shit. Excel was one of those things. Niggas used to come to me at work to build out data sheets because I was I knew how to do that. I could sort that. I knew how to fill out all that shit. Formulas, I figured out all that shit. Yeah. So I took that skill and everything that I do in business. Like when Tieta first came into my business, I had a drive probably of hundreds of different spreadsheets and I ran through them all like, this is for this, this is for this, this is for this, you feel me? So that was always just a thing after I left that job, I've been using spreadsheets. My whole discography, like I, I just transferred catalog to a new distro. I was able to just go in, send the code, this is what it is. If I didn't have a spreadsheet and I had to go through and find each release and go through you, I'd be fucked. You feel me? Like that shit just has, it's helped me run the business tenfold, a hundred times better. <laughs> like, bro, people don't know, man. That, that uh, Excel sheet skill set, bro. Excel, Excel is a powerful <laughs> tool, man. That's one thing I think everybody should learn. If you run a business, learn Excel. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I just thought that was so beautiful. I was like, man, this is great to see that he he's doing this because if he's doing this for this, I know it. You don't just make up a spreadsheet just for the sake of it, right? It's like, no, he's doing this, man. Right. And you mentioned you worked in aerospace. Like, what does that even mean, right? Like, is that is that yeah, I don't even like that's outside. So I was I was working at an aerospace plant that made like uh, explosives and, and material for like Boeing, Boeing fighter plane shit, shit, just different shit like that. Like fucking Sumishu, all the uh, 
all this shit, safety shit, like shoots that come out of planes when you need to deploy and all that type shit. And uh, when I started there, I was working like production just as a contractor, temp job and shit. And I just start moving up. I start improving systems and figuring out how to do shit better and going leading and shit. And I eventually got to move up to like the administrative side that was off the production floor and just learning the back end, the contracts and sales orders and purchase orders and how to read shit like that. And I just kind of all that skill came from that shit. Dope. Dope, man. I think it's really beneficial for artists. I know everybody wants to pop as young as they as they can and like before they really do much, but I think it's beneficial to be able to work in something like that. Whatever the, the industry is, because a lot of different industries bring different as, uh, right. professional insights. You never know like what it's gearing you for. Yeah. You know, like I'm happy that I did work, like, because you never know what skill you're learning and for what. Like I learned how to lead and how to run a team and how to operate shit from being at that job. Mm. See, man, y'all y'all go ahead and get that regular money, right? And, yeah. and then apply it to yourself because you yeah. can, the skills I think are the underrated part of it. Right? That regular money provides you the base to make irregular money. You feel me? Like that's sometimes where you got to start. Yeah. That's, that's the easiest way. That's your label. When you start in your job, your nine to five is your label. That's how you get the funding to do whatever the fuck you want to do. All my first shows, the paper came from me working a job, all the early marketing, me working a job, and my pops working his job and putting his paper in. The homies working their jobs and putting their paper in. What do you say to artists who don't want to do the work that you're doing to build their, their career? Cause it's a lot of work. Like, <laughs> Quit. <laughs> <laughs> Quit. <laughs> I mean, that's easy. You can save yourself some time. Yeah. I mean, but don't even quit actually because you might get lucky. You know, there is luck. Luck does strike. And sometimes you get lucky and you ain't got to do no work and you can still make it and have the, have a similar success. Kind of, you yeah. feel me? So just, but you know, keep your expectations level. If you're not willing to do the work, then just don't expect all the things that the niggas who did the work got. Real. Oh yeah, that's a fact, man. Like that's that's the energy I personally like. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very you know I come from sports, so <laughs> that makes sense. Right. It's not enough, you know, music people telling people to quit, bro. It sounds fucked up, but you know, it's not fucked up at all. Creatives, you can go to the the executives that might talk that talk or name that. I mean, I think I that. think sometimes it saves you time. Yeah. Like quitting doesn't mean you stop and do nothing. Quitting can mean you stop that and you go do something that you love that you're willing to put the work in for. It. You feel me? It's not like quit and go die. It's quit and go find something that you're passionate about so you don't even have to worry about doing the work. If a nigga got to convince you to do the work, you in the wrong field already. <laughs> you don't love what you do. I haven't. I, I made 25 albums and no one had to force me to do it. I love doing what I do. You feel me? That's not work. No one should have to convince you to do that. If you got to convince your artist to post and to make content and do all that, it's like, you know, maybe this isn't for you. Or you have to find people that will do those things while you just do the parts you love. Like, I get some artists that's like, I don't want to make content. I don't want to book shows. It's like, all right, make your music. But... Now you gotta go find the people that do do that. Otherwise, keep your expectations, you know, minimal. So you're not depressed and fucked up about it. Yeah. And you mentioned community earlier. Definitely one of the things that I got we gotta talk about before we end this. How do you look at community? Cause we had a little debate. Yeah. We had a little debate. And to me, I'm like, you are building community better than anybody else, right? Yeah. Uh, in all ways, <laughs> I'm not gonna go into the details of the debate, the but with you and that guy. So, Stunner Man 02, my dog, he's an artist from San Francisco, and he said it best community is common unity. It's literally a bunch of people who have something in common and choosing to stand together behind it. My community is a bunch of niggas who agree with the way that I live and the shit that I do and fuck with my ethics. We all have that in common and we unite together. It's as simple as that. That's what every community is. What are your ethics? What do you stand for? Uh, just doing dope shit. <laughs> taking care of the people that take care of you. Taking care of the people who don't take care of you. Taking care of the people who need to be taken care of because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, sharing. Putting niggas in position. Um, doing what you love. Doing whatever the fuck you want to do. 
um, and showing people that that's a possibility. Um, building shit that's sustainable, that everybody gets to benefit off of and eat from for the rest of their life. Uh, it's a bunch of them. <laughs> it's a bunch of ethics within there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, man, well, I love that, bro. Appreciate you for having us out here, man. It's a beautiful scene. We can't wait to see this show. Come on. You know, on Sunday, we definitely going to catch some footage from that, see the man live and direct. Um, if there's anything that you want to leave people with, what would you want to leave them with here? He who is willing is who will. Mm. Love that, man. Every time. Hey, man, you got, you got hella quotes on deck, man. You know, I be, I be, hey, sometimes <laughs> we be talking and I come up with a metaphor and it's like, boom. We need the book, man. <laughs> we need the little quote booklet. We already got one. It's called Limitless. I got you before you go. Oh, that's a fact, yeah. bro. That's a fact. Come on. I love it, man. Yeah. Well, yo, that's yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. I'm Brandman Shine. I'm Corey. I'm LaRussell. And we out. Come on. Peace. <laughs>